thank you everyone for joining us for the third uh, Pukar Learning Circle. Uh, today, Bhargavi, Pavitra and Geetika will be sharing with us more about their work on using data from courts to empower the litigants. Uh, I'll leave it to them to share more. Uh, but before that, a little bit about the learning circles. As you know, the idea behind the learning circle is to share work in progress versions of various things that all of us have been working on uh, with an objective of transforming the dispute resolution experience of citizens. Uh, so it's a learning circle, uh, and the idea really is to share raw ideas and use all our collective thinking to connect the dots and learn from each other, seek inputs, etc. Uh, I promise that there'll be a different kind of introduction this time. So I'll <laughs> hand it over to Gitika for uh, for the introductions and taking it forward. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Gitika. I'm a data geek who works at XKDR. And very recently, I've started dipping my feet into doing legal systems research from the data angle, of course. Um, so we're here today to brainstorm about looking at courts and their performance from the perspective of a litigant. There's been recent Indian literature that developed on trying to find, trying to measure performance of courts. And that has usually focused on the court side or the supplier side of things, which happens to be caseload or pendency. These are metrics that are designed for the court by the court. Uh, we, however, take a different stance. We try to look at the demand side of things, the other half of every case, which happens to be the litigant. And that is the uh, lens through which we do our research. Pavitra and Bhargavi will take you through that. But uh, before we do that, I'd want us to step into a little bit of a game. Uh, so I have shared a link with everyone on the chat. If you all can join that and just answer the question, that will be useful. I will be displaying what it is that we find. Just share the link again for those who've just joined. Gitika, the things that I'm inputting are not reflecting here. Just do a refresh. I think my machine is stuck. Sorry. I'll join that. It should, I think, it should change. Sorry, my machine's giving trouble. I'll join back. You know, meanwhile, uh, while Gitika joins, um, if there's anything that speaks out loud to you in terms of the question that Gitika has asked, which is what is your expectation of an ideal court, you can also just unmute yourself and uh, say the answer out loud. Uh, an expectation that I have from an ideal court is uh, that of predictability, 
uh, that I know what's going to happen at what time, uh, at what periodicity. I think something that's uh, most important to me that I think is also reflective on the screen is just three different words for quick that you want resolution to happen as soon as the dispute arises. So, uh, one of the problems probably with speed is that we might be trading accuracy for speed. Is it better to have a code which is correct and a bit slow or a code which is fast but incorrect a lot of number of times so uh, there is this belief in india that we can trade one for the other or there is an implicit trade we are doing and accuracy is probably more important than speed yeah i would imagine that there are different priorities that we assign to uh, each of these. Maybe accuracy is one notch higher than uh, speed, but at the same time, it, speed does feature into uh, the expectations that one would have from the code. So we did some study on SEBI. It's not a pure code, but it's an adjudication mechanism. And roughly 70% of the orders of SEBI that were being contested were being sent back by SAT for re-adjudication. SEBI mm -hmm. is not the fastest adjudicating body, but sometimes it's considered pretty fast. Now, you have a 70% error rate by SAT's judgment. Then, yeah, you can be, well, you might be harming the system by, imagine all the wrong orders as per SAT's opinion. There's no other independent way of judging the accuracy of a judgment. That might be an incentive. So, one of the things which is a feature of the Indian system is that we have a very high appeal rate. More than the trials, we have very high number of appeals. Our appeal courts are flooded. Uh, one of the reasons is probably because litigants feel that the judgment was inaccurate. And the reason why they feel is probably because a vast number of cases do get overturned. Like, what is the right number of cases that should get overturned in the trial court? Like, the latest book by Hubbard shows that the Indian Supreme Court has a very high overturn rate compared to most other jurisdictions. What was that rate mean, Shubhu? Oh, okay, sorry. Bhargav, you sorry. No, I'm saying, uh, do we have the word cloud of litigants' yeah. expectations? Can you put it up? I'm just trying to join back. Just give me a second. Okay. So think about it, it's almost like the Supreme Court takes around 50,000 judgments a year on a steady state. That means 50,000 judgments every year of the Indian judicial system needs some intervention from the highest court in this country. Compared to what the US has like 18 or 19 judgments per session, 36 judgments in two sessions of the US Supreme Court where they decide to intervene. I'm not talking about whether they overturn or not, but 50,000 judgments in India need the attention of the Supreme Court. That is something wrong in the Indian system. So I guess, you know, what we were uh, trying to get at is that if we were to just look at this system from the perspective of litigants, surely we all value accuracy. I would call it fairness. Somebody else would call it accuracy. Somebody else would call it short judgment. Somebody else would call it simple judgment, but we value quality. We, as for this word cloud, you know, these are the words that uh, the attendees have actually put in. So it's amazing, right? I mean, there's just so much that people actually value about courts. Some people, so fairness is mentioned, supportive is mentioned, finality. Okay, beautiful. So I think what strikes out the most, to me at least, is fast, speedy. Uh, okay, let's let's see what else. Timeliness, I would put that as fast or speedy, right? Uh, accessible, affordable, I would put that in one category. But it seems to me that we all value some things about a court as litigants, but we value some things more than others. And the whole idea was to ask you, what is that one word, one attribute that would come to your mind, you know, if you were to approach a court as a litigant? Like, 
you know, it's okay if the court is slow, but at least it should be a correct judgment. Or some people say it's okay if the court gives the wrong judgment, but at least I want a fast interim relief, you know? So those are the different things, but thanks for participating in this word cloud and, you know, helping us just for, get some picture of what do you expect from courts as litigants. So, you know, what I'm going to do is, uh, Geetika, if you can just stop sharing the screen. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, all right. So why are we doing this, right? So um, this is a little bit of a pilot that we uh, did at XKDR. Uh, which, uh, just give me one minute, I will just expand the screen. And it will all be fine. The world will be normal. Okay. okay. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Great. Great. Okay. So, uh, like Gitika mentioned, you know, since the last maybe 15 years or so, uh, there has been a lot of research that is much more empirically uh, sound used with data on Indian courts. However, there has been an overwhelming focus on things like pendency, disposal rate, time to disposal, judicial vacancy, right? Uh, these all are important metrics, but they largely solve the problem for the system. However, when a litigant approaches a court, okay, when he's left with no choice and he approaches a court, the litigant doesn't really care about what is the pendency before the court. He doesn't care about is there a judicial vacancy or not. What he cares about is about his own matter. When will his matter be first heard? What is the likelihood of interim relief? When will his matter get disposed of? What is the likelihood that the judge will be nice to him? Uh, what is the likelihood of appeal? And so on and so forth. We do not yet have these information. And litigants mostly have to rely on either lawyers or friends and family to answer the most basic questions about the judiciary and how their case is likely to proceed through the, through the system. So we thought that can we use and can we reimagine the way we look at the massive amounts of data that courts are putting out to answer these questions and make it easier for the litigant to make, answer these questions. So then the natural question for us is, but what do litigants really want to know about courts? And some of it obviously came up in the word cloud. And it seems to me that a lot of what came up in the word cloud, luckily for us, also fits in our academic framework, right? So what we did is we actually surveyed most of the global literature that is written on litigant preferences. A lot of this surveys litigants on a timely basis, as you can imagine, mostly in the West, to understand what do litigants value the most about courts. And it seems like there are five, all of the attributes, I think, which were mentioned in the word cloud, and which the surveys have actually thrown up can be clubbed into five categories. The first is independence. So, you know, what Shubo mentioned, which is accuracy. I would put accuracy or fairness under the bucket of independence because then how do you measure independence? Uh, so the literature suggests that you can measure independence in two ways. You can measure how fair the court is from a due process perspective or how fair the court is in a, on a substantive basis, that is distributive fairness. The second thing that litigants happen to value is efficiency. So we saw speed and timeliness and all of that being mentioned in the word cloud. Turns out that the surveys have also thrown up the same results. How do we measure efficiency? Mostly efficiency is measured through workload and timeliness, which is timeliness of completion, timeliness of hearing, and so on and so forth. The third thing that litigants seem to be valuing a lot is effectiveness, which is what are the chances that once a decree is passed by a court, it will actually be enforced? So if, a, if or if an order is passed by the court, within how many months can I expect to get my money back? Things like that, right? Or, or how, what are the chances that it will be appealed? So litigants truly value. So I think somebody had mentioned finality. I would put it under the bucket of effectiveness. Predictability. I usually mentioned predictability. I think somebody had mentioned certainty or something like that in the word cloud. So yes, we all value the predictability of the system. So here we take the system as a given. The system is as slow or as fast, and one litigant can't really move the needle on that. But the litigant can plan his affairs around the system if the system gives him a certain predictability. If a hearing is listed tomorrow, if my case is listed tomorrow, will it reach? Will it actually happen? Will it be substantively heard or will the papers not be not have reached the judge? Or will the opposite side take an adjournment? Things like that. And finally, Costs. I mean, this. I feel like this is the most intuitive sort of, uh, you know, metric by which how costly will it be to approach this court. And when I say that, I don't only mean the court fees, but I also mean lawyer fees because that happens to be the bulk of the cost for most people, right? And the convenience of it, especially in cases where I have to be personally there. So it seems to me that 
a lot of what we value by cost will pretty much be covered in these pi metrics. And the challenge therefore then for us was how can we even measure a port in India on these metrics, right? So what we said is, okay, let's try this out. And we, uh, uh, just, uh, just let me know if you're able to see the screen. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Have you opened a new screen? We no, are no. seeing yeah. the old one. Oh, you're seeing the old one? Okay. Yeah. So, okay, just give me one minute. Is the new screen now visible, which is a website? Yeah. Great. All right. So we said that let's think of uh, a way in which we can design something that will help litigants make these decisions in a more uh, informed manner. And uh, we, uh, uh, Uloy Labs, I think Akshay is on the call, uh, his team along with us and Agami, we try to develop this front end where litigants can actually make sense of the massive amounts of data that is thrown up by courts for qu to answer queries that are of interest to them. Right, so what we said is let's start small. Let's start with the easy stuff. We picked up one type of court, which is debt recovery courts, to and designed the front end around debt recovery courts. Now, why debt recovery? I mean, there are arguably there are many other cases which are way more important than debt recovery. But the reason we picked debt recovery is actually twofold. One is that it seems to me that amongst all the commercial claims that are that exist, you know, that can arise, debt recovery seems to be the most common, right? And it is litigant class agnostic. What do I mean by that? It means that it affects the poorest litigant. So imagine a senior citizen couple that actually depends on rental income by renting out their one investment, uh, real estate investment flat, or that depends on pension income. It affects a small wind, a small business that actually supplies spare parts to, uh, I don't know, an auto, com an auto manufacturer. It, and it affects the richest creditor, which is banks, right? It affects all kinds of people in this uh, country. The, the, and if they are defaulted upon, how do they decide where to go? So the second reason was all debt recovery claims, there are multiple options in which you can enforce if a default is made to you, right? You can go to NCLT, you can go to BRT, you can file a civil suit, you can file, uh, if, there are, if there are bound checks, you can file section 138 claims, you can go to ADR and so on and so forth. So it seems like, okay, we are able to do this on a debt recovery uh, 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 claim, then people will actually be able to use this information to make those choices which forum to approach, right? And the third is the easy one, which is that we all happen to be familiar with the IBC and all of BRT and all of that. So we just kind of uh, let's just say we're opportunistic and we said that let's roll this out. Let's let's start with a small thing, which is debt recovery matters. So this website is rather simple. If you're involved in a legal dispute regarding debt recovery, this website will help you make choices among the legal remedies that are available. Uh, if I, okay, now are we able to see the next screen? Okay, so what we've tried to do is we've tried to do a more of a handhold, handheld experience, a more interactive, or I guess, you know, the more fashionable word these days is, immersive experience where the peop the person can actually interact. So are you a creditor or debtor? Suppose I say I'm a creditor. Um, now, okay, this can be annoying, right? I mean, why am I asking so many questions before giving this information? Now, the way jurisdiction is, is designed under the laws in India, unfortunately or fortunately, I need to know the amount that you have been defaulted upon, right? So I say, suppose, okay, the amount, I'm a small spare parts manufacturer, I supply, not uh, uh no i said i'm a bank right i'm a bank and there's somebody's taken uh, a loan and they've defaulted let's just start with the highest amount about one crore right what is the nature of the debtor okay the borrower is a company suppose now once you supply these parameters to the system the system throws up what are the options available to that litigant all right so here in this case for example and again this is just a template you can approach the Bombay High Court, the Debt Recovery Tribunal, the National Company Law Tribunal, right? If your dispute involves bounce checks, you can also approach the Metropolitan Magistrate. <clears throat> and then there's some extra information about how if you go to the NCLT, it really becomes a collective resolution process. Once the litigant has this information, what are some of the basic questions that any litigant, irrespective of size will or class will ask, right? The first one is, how much time will my case 
take to get disposed of. And what we did is we actually scraped data for about three years, 2018, 2022, about two and uh, four years. And from the websites of these cases, these are life cycle, uh, case life cycle data to answer questions like this. So what we found is that the NCLT is the quickest to dispose of cases, all right? And the DRT takes the longest to dispose of cases. I guess this is most intuitive to a lot of lawyers. I, I, I'm not able to see the audience, but I'm assuming that if some people are familiar with practicing before these fora, maybe this is very intuitive or so obvious, what is it, right? Now, however, this is the average duration of a case. What happens when I just take 50% of the cases, right? Often, in for those who are familiar with statistical analysis, averages are skewed by one or two or three uh, cases, which take an extremely long time, which skews your average towards a longer time. But when you take median, that's, you know, it's a much more um, non-skewed uh, uh, result that you get. And therefore, we also did the median. And what we find is that if we take median time for disposal, then about 50% of the cases have been disposed of at the DRT within one year, three months. And by the median, uh, the DRT actually is the fastest and the Bombay High Court is the slowest. Now, this is rather counterintuitive, I'm assuming, uh, for a lot of people, especially for me. Uh, and I'm assuming a lot of lawyers as well. Um, okay, what is the next important question that a litigant might want to know? He might want to know, when will my first hearing happen, right? Why first hearing? Because at the first hearing, often, first time the judge will actually get to look at your case. Often, it's a case made for ad interim relief or interim relief. And therefore, and often litigants use that as a negotiation tool outside of court to then, and it, deter, it has a big influence on, the, on whether settlement will happen in favor of the party who got the interim relief or not, um, or whether um, the opposite party will come to the table to negotiate, uh, and generally the course of the proceeding, right? So it seems that, at least from the data, it seems that Bombay High Court is the quickest to hold a first hearing, and the DRT takes the longest time to hold the first hearing. Okay, now how does the litigant pass this information? So if you're a litigant who actually values time to disposal, you'd probably say that, you know, I'm probably better off at the DRT, but if you're a litigant who believes that my chance of getting an ad interim relief for example, a bank or getting an account freeze or, or getting an attachment are high, I would, I'm would. i better off actually at the Bombay High Court, okay? Assuming I know that, you know, the, the whatever cases are adjudicated before the DRT, uh, they are excluded from the jurisdiction of the High Court. But this is a model for, this is an approach question. It's not so much, a, you know, a, a litigant question. But imagine if it were an NBFC that's not notified for DRT purposes, okay, then all these three courts would be applicable. The point that I'm trying to make is, depending on what you prioritize more, a, first, a quicker first hearing or a quicker disposal, this information might help you think about how to make that choice. Average number of hearings, uh, why is this important? Because often legal fees are linked to number of hearings, especially substantive hearings. And here it seems like NCLT takes the most number of hearings until disposal and Bombay High Court and DRT actually take a pretty uh, equal number of hearings until disposal. So if you're an extremely cost sensitive uh, litigant, maybe this is relevant to you. And um, what is the frequency of hearings? So in, okay, so if you're a litigant who actually wants to be present in court to monitor your lawyer or to hear the judge and see what is going on and you want to be present, then you're really looking, if you're at the NCLT, you're really looking at having to go to the NCLT every one and a half months. Whereas in the Bombay High Court and the DRT, you know, the hearings are more spaced out. And uh, once in six months is when the hearing happens. Now, just to connect back to the word cloud, right? These questions, this information helps the litigant figure out his efficiency parameter, his speed parameter. But it doesn't really tell him much more about the court, right? So what we did is, we create, we conducted a survey where we conducted a, people, you know, where we surveyed people. Um, I'll be very honest, it's a, it's a survey of 20, 20 people uh, who frequently practice before these fora and the, or the Metropolitan Magistrate and the, and ADR, who basically frequently practice in the debt recovery space. And we actually surveyed them on each of those five parameters. What we did is we give them a, classical problem, a canonical problem that this is an NBFC, this is a large listed company, large listed company defaults to the NBFC, this is the value of its debt, uh, which 
how would you rank each of these forums on a scale of one to five? One being the highest and five being the lowest. Um, all right, what we found is that the user experience survey suggested that people are more satisfied with the Bombay High Court and least satisfied with the DRT. Now, these, this is a perception survey, right? Okay, so this is how the survey results on each parameter look like. So the way to read this table is you look at, for example, you look at the column of efficiency, right? On the column of efficiency, each of these tribute, each of these fora, Bombay High Court, NCLT, ADR, so alternative dispute resolution, BRT, and Metropolitan Magistrate are ranked on a score of one. Now, just one thing to remember is each of the people who are ranking this survey are ranking them, keeping in mind one kind of problem. So it's not like I'm looking at a small creditor and somebody else is actually ranking these scores based on a big creditor. It's one kind of a problem. So we've we've tried to control for all kinds of subjectivity that may come in depending on your view of who the litigant is, right? So on the efficiency parameter, uh, people rank NCLT the highest. So NCLT gets a score of 0.81 on a score of one. And people rank the Metropolitan Magistrate the lowest and the DRT marginally high. But, you know, we already know this from data that actually if you want an interim relief, Bombay High Court is the fastest. And if you want time to disposal, then NCLT is the fastest. Nothing new here. Okay, let's see what, what do we not know. Independence, so accuracy, fairness, something that, you know, repeatedly came up in the conversation when we were making that word cloud. Uh, there, it seems like people find rank the Bombay High Court the highest. So on a score of one, it gets the highest of 8.3. And second comes the ADR process. And on accessibility, accordingly, you can see this. Now, the total column gives you the score out of five. And here we find that people score Bombay High Court the highest. So their experience of the Bombay High Court on each of these parameters turns out to be the, uh, on an average, if you average out their scores, it turns out to be the highest. And NCLT the second, which is just marginally lower, uh, or rather let's just say Bombay High Court is only marginally better than the NCLT, which in turn is only marginally better than ADR. So this is what, uh, this is the kind of information that we thought uh, might help the litigant more than, you know, uh, what he currently has at hand to make these choices. I will now request Pavitra to just share two or three more insightful findings that we could deduce from this data. And then we wanted your inputs on everything right from, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea to if you think that this can be expanded in different ways and uh, we'll, we'll open the floor for that. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming my screen is, screen is visible. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, as uh, even the tool that Bhargavi had showed uh, mentioned that we had calculated some average figures for uh, disposal, first sharing, etc. And most of the literature that we saw and all the work done by everybody, both in India and otherwise, uh, measures scores based on um, average. Uh, figures and aggregate figures, whether they're trying to measure speed or trying to measure how many hearings have taken place or trying to measure adjournments even. Uh, it's mostly aggregates and averages. Uh, but this has some limitations. So uh, firstly, when you say time to disposal, right? Uh, it uh, takes into account only time to disposal of disposed cases, obviously. But what about the pending cases? Um, most, at least 60 to 70 percent of the cases uh, of a court at any given year are actually pending cases. And the time taken for pending cases also has an impact on how long the, any case will get disposed of. So that kind of uh, gets uh, not get does not get factored in. Secondly, it does not consider the variation in the amounts involved or the complexity of the cases. Yeah, maybe you can say uh, average disposal time at a particular court is uh, two years, but maybe that was the best case scenario. Maybe those cases actually got disposed of fast because they were simple cases. Um, and uh, also reporting averages, what does it do? So there might be a case which takes two years, there might be a case which takes seven years, eight years, like we've heard uh, many times. Then that's really a skewing effect that happens uh, when the figures get reported. And finally, uh, if you say, okay, this court's 
pendency is too much, backlog is too much. It really doesn't matter to the litigant. Litigant cares about her her one case. Uh, so what did we try to do? Uh, we tried to use uh, the survival model, uh, which is a uh, statistical method to answer questions that we thought will actually help litigants uh, give some idea about how long her case will take. Uh, so this model basically takes into uh, account by uh, taking into taking a time of a particular event of interest. So this event of interest could be a disposal, it could be a first hearing, it could be a first substantive hearing. Uh, just to illustrate this, um, okay, just bear with me for a couple of minutes. Uh, this uh, model was uh, formulated or started being used in the medical sciences field, right? Uh, so, for instance, if at uh, day zero, 100 patients were given cancer treatment, um, or after one year, how many of these patients actually survived the treatment, right? So uh, if you see, for instance, this blue curve on the uh, screen, as and when a person dies, this curve will keep dropping. And at any given point in time, you can see, see for example, one year. If you see a point at one year, uh, it corresponds to about 0.62, that is 62%. So you can say at one year after giving a particular treatment, about 62% of the patients for whom the treatments were given survived that is they lived okay um and if you have to apply this to our uh, case life cycle uh, data from scores uh on day zero all the cases are pending as in when the case gets disposed of you see uh, take for instance the blue line of that which corresponds to nclt as in when a case gets disposed of this line keeps dropping and at the one year point you see that about 60 to 62 percent of the cases are still pending so if you had to find out how many cases what's the likelihood of case getting disposed of you apply the corollary so 60 to 100 minus 62 that would be about 38 percent of the cases have a chance of getting disposed of within one year of filing a case at nclt similarly the green line corresponds to drt that is uh, about 20 percent uh, there's a likelihood of 20% of cases getting disposed of in the DRT within one year. And for the BHC also, it's almost close to 18-20%. Uh, uh, this is the concept. We can discuss it later if you have any questions. And Deepika is on the line who uh, has uh, put this together. So I'm just going forward. With so we, are, we can do this at different point in time. Uh, what's the chance of getting a disposal within six months, within 12 months, within 15 months? Uh, if you had to compare it across the three codes of our interest, you see that NCLT has, uh, has in NCLT, you have the highest chances of getting disposed of within uh, 12 months. Uh, and DRT and the Bombay High Court are all, almost the same within a year. But if you extend it by a few more months, 15 months, uh, Bombay High Court, there's a 30% chance of getting disposed of. In DRP, it remains about 20%. We can apply the same thing by changing the event of interest to a first hearing. And um, we try to see what's the chance of getting a first hearing within three months, six months, and 12 months. Uh, at both NCLT and DRP, uh, within a year, you almost are sure to get a first hearing. But this is uh, comparatively lesser in the Bombay High Court with less than 50% chances. Um, okay, this is something uh, that we have we hadn't shown in the tool. So what did we do here? Um, okay, we know that first hearing is important. Bhargavi told us why first hearing is important. But what if the first hearing was just an adjournment, right? And we know that Indian courts, uh, there, there's a tendency to uh, grant multiple adjournments and it can be attributed to any part, whether the party was that wrong or it was an administration problem or uh, whatever would be the case. So we thought, let's find out what's the date of what's the problem of getting a first substantive hearing? Uh, so for this, we did a micro study. Uh, we went through the order details of about uh, 200 cases for each of the three codes. That's about 600 cases and about 2000 odd uh, hearing uh, orders. And we uh, found the chance of getting a first substantive hearing for these three codes. Uh, so at uh, within six months, if you take six months as a time of interest, 
then uh, in DRT, you have the least chance of getting a first substantive hearing within six months. Uh, Bombay in Bi Bombay High Court, there's a high chance, and at NCLT, NCLT it's about 25%. Okay, so just if uh, people on the call who are interested about the data, etc., I um, I can quickly go through it. If you have more questions, you can later on uh, bring it up. Uh, for each of the three courts, we scrape the data from the respective court website itself. Each court has a different way of organizing its li uh, case lifecycle information. For the Bombay High Court, we used the case status tab. For NCLT, we used the daily orders. DRT was a bit tricky, so we had to uh, take the daily orders, pull the case number from that, put, put it in a different tab, and get the full case lifecycle information. And um, uh, from the Bombay High Court, we took only four case tabs because that, those case tabs pertain to uh, debt matters, which we, we were interested in. NCLT has both IBC and uh, uh, Companies Act cases here because it was matters relating to debt. We took only the IBC cases. And uh, we know DRT deals with third facing and uh, the recovery of debts due to banks and financial institutions. Act. OK, so uh, while we have a bigger bigger data set, which is almost about 10,000, 15,000 cases across the three codes, uh, we needed to ensure some sort of parity when we are comparing these three codes. So uh, the comparable data was available only from September 2021 to uh, December 2022. That is uh, data that could actually be uniformly collected for all three codes. Now, Bombay High Court, it stems, uh, we have from 2017. NCLT, we have from uh, 2016, uh, from when the NCLT was set up, but uh, the website does not archive the data. So we only get uh, cases that are still pending whether or not uh, they were filed before September 2021. This is just a, a general uh, verification of how many cases are disposed and pending. Like I said, most cases are pending, so it's important to take into consideration pending cases when we are doing any sort of calculation. Okay, um, that's about it. Uh, so every forum uh, that we have considered may have different features the nature of remedies that's available might be different. Uh, like Bhargavi mentioned, the pecuniary jurisdiction might be different. Uh, so it really, are, we will give the information and it really comes down to what matters to the litigant. Uh, but what we wanted to show is a demonstration of the approach that if more than one forum is available for a litigant for a dispute, dispute how can we help her make an informed choice about which forum to approach? And uh, why is this important, right? Uh, because if the quality of decision made by the litigant is poor, uh, uh, she will be she will not be informed of say okay NCLT takes more time so I might as well settle the matter or maybe I'll just go to the uh, go to the metropolitan magistrate court. So then there, there we think there would be more uniform uh, workload across courts. Um, uh, otherwise, it leads to high pendencies and delays in disposal, and we all know it has repercussions in terms of economic output, contract enforcement, and uh, uh, prospect of doing business in India uh, for people outside as well. Okay, I'm going to stop here, um, and uh, this, these questions are just for us to think about, um, and uh, of course, feel free to bring up any other questions uh, or inputs that uh, you may have. But these are just three broad ones that we thought is worth discussing, probably. Pavitra, would you like to go question by question? Or would you like comments? Uh, like, would you like to open the floor for comments first? Uh, how would you like to approach this? Um, I think we can just open it up. Uh, okay. So uh, just to give uh, let every okay i'll just leave the questions on the screen and maybe we can just open it up if anybody wants to ask. okay um i have a question uh so my question is that um the survey that you were conducting were there open-ended questions as well uh to identify if there are other things apart from these five that the litigants valued uh you know for instance something that came to me was the adequacy of information that i have when I'm filing a case, uh, it could be uh, not only adequacy that you know this uh, that, that this work seems to solve, which is okay. Where should I file the case? But also adequacy of information in terms of should I file a case? Uh, what happens if I file a case? Uh, 
what are my next steps etc i would say that now even co like the courts uh, have that duty of sharing that information with the litigants did that come up Uh, Bhargavi, do you want to take it? Shall I go for it? No, go for it. Okay, so uh, the quest, the results for the questions that we have showed you are uh, mostly to lawyers uh, who have who are used to practicing in these uh, for a be it SCRT, DRT, ADR, etc. And uh, so the question of how do you go about filing a case, etc., that does not uh, come into question. But we did ask a question up front, uh, saying, if you if you were to look for something, which which is the most preferred forum of your importance, you know, uh, there we did not ask. We just gave a open question, giving the five options, and we said, which forum would you approach to resolve your dispute? And then we went into each of the metrics. Does that answer your question? Is there a so, reason why you did? Start? Sorry, yeah. if I may just supplement what Pavitra is saying. We had one specific question on adequacy of information, which is that, did you find the website of the, how would you rank the websites of these forums on a scale of one to five? Now here, given that the respondents were, I would call them sophisticated respondents, right? They are repeat players in this system. We did not ask them, do you know, did, did the website tell you what is the next step? However, okay. we have done an offline survey at the DRT of about 55 respondents who are litigants in person, who are not lawyers. And there we ask this question, which is that, you know, uh, did you, was the website of the forum helpful? Did you have enough information? So I think uh, the reason, I think we found it important to sort of cater the question to the kind of the respondent that we're asking to. And that's that's how we were thinking about this. Got it. Uh, Moli, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks so much for this. Uh, I was trying to figure out the initial part with what you're presenting here, which was about SAT, uh, that doesn't seem to be part of this discussion. Uh, and my question there was, you're assuming that when an order of SEBI is reversed by SAT, it goes to quality. Now that would be right if the SAT decision was finally upheld in the Supreme Court. Then I would agree that it shows that SEBI order was very poor. Do we have any data to suggest that, that? that the SAC orders are all upheld by the Supreme Court? So if I may just, uh, uh, thanks, Malir. So that's a, that's a very important question because we actually debated uh, ad nauseum on whether we could include appealability, right? Like uh, the rates of appeal uh, to categorize these courts. I think Shubo was talking about that discussion in the context of quality of orders, but we have deliberately not included appeals as in the five parameters because we think that Actually, whether somebody chooses to appeal or not is not a sign of the accuracy or the fairness of the order. Sure, it may be a rough proxy, but the decision to appeal or not to appeal is driven by many, many other things, including financial constraints and all of that. So in our parameters, just to answer your question, we've not included appeals as something that the litigant really cares about. We've included other no. things. Like, so uh, sorry, if I may just complete, we, we asked the question, what are the chances that you'll get the money in your account once an order is passed, right? So, uh, and how would you rank the court on that parameter? That's how we've asked this question right now. Okay, because uh, I think if you ask people who practice in the SEBI SAT area, uh, almost every order of, of SEBI is going to be appealed to the SAT and every order of the SAT is going to be appealed further. So the quality of whatever SEBI has said is not indicative of whether SAT is going to listen to it. And what SAT says on it is really not reflective of whether that is the law or SAT is right on it, because several of these will get appealed to the Supreme Court, and we will not know in a reasonable time whether that order of SEBI has actually been confirmed by the Supreme Court or the Supreme yeah. Court agrees with the SAT. So, and, and that's a good reason not to put it in your uh, data yeah. that you're doing here. The one other question yeah. I had for you was uh, the Bombay High Court is kind of unique and I don't think it's comparable with either the DRT or the NCLT. What is comparable really is going to be a civil court. So if you go to Bangalore and did this exercise, you'd find a completely different answer. 
the Bombay High Court hasn't done a trial in a commercial matter in my lifetime. So if you spoke to any of the lawyers practicing on the original side in the Bombay High Court, and you asked them this specific question, when was the last time you did a trial in the Bombay High Court? And I'd like right. to see the list of lawyers who have ever done a trial in the Bombay High Court. I no, suspect there will, be, there will be less than two. You know, when I spoke to Pradeep Sanjayati a few years ago, he said when he was uh, in his first year in practice, which is 30 years ago, he was witness to a trial in a commercial matter. And I haven't seen one in 30 years of practice in the Bombay High Court. So again, you're taking something which is not comparable, I think, by using the Bombay High Court as an example, because a trial will never happen. So if you got the same data from the, let's say, city civil court in Bangalore, which is really comparable to the DRT and comparable to everything else, I'd like to see what that information looks like. You know, Then would you make the same choice? Uh, the Bombay High Court, I don't think is a good comparator. No, that's a fair point. But uh, here you're assuming that the litigant actually places no weightage on whether or not there's a trial because precisely for the reason that you mentioned, which is that um, a lot of the cases actually get settled outside, right? After the first or the second hearing, depending on how, partly depending on how the hearing is going, partly depending on the parties itself. What happens in the Bombay High Court often is settlement terms, consent terms, you know, as you can imagine, are filed in a lot of matters. And if that actually resolves the matter to the satisfaction of the litigants, so be it. If it happens faster, if consent terms are being filed faster in the Bombay High Court, then NCLT can actually uh, sit and adjudicate on the merits of the matter because there also no trial is happening. I mean, it's just, you know, there's no witness being examined or anything of that sort, right? So uh, the the so I'll just tell you the mental model we applied, that when somebody defaults on a debt and you walk into a lawyer's chamber, and you tell them this is the debt amount, this is the, you know, this is the creditor, this is the nature of the, what are the options that the lawyer will offer uh, to the litigant, assuming the lawyer who knows about most of these forums, uh, to pursue, right? The first thing that comes to mind is NCLT, DRT. And the reason we took the Bombay High Court is we said that, look, for what it's worth, people may even offer Bombay High Court the commercial bench as an option. So that's what I'm thinking, because Bombay High Court is commercial jurisdiction, but I agree, we need to expand this to other states and maybe we'll find very different things from their city civil court related uh, information. I don't know, but that's, yeah, that's the plan. Let's see. Okay, but just one more addition to that is if 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 your NCLT and DRT does not have the jurisdiction and because Bombay High Court has the original jurisdiction, it starts at one crore. If you had a debt matter that cannot fall under NCLT or DRT, then what else do you do? Also, this forces you, because of the system in the Bombay High Court where there is no trial, people are forced to negotiate whatever they can get. So uh, the problem that arises is that in the first hearing or the first substantive hearing, whoever gets an interim order is now in a great place to negotiate because you never, you know that this will never go to trial and you're going to sit on this property in your case of a tenant uh, if it's going to happen that way or whoever it is who's, who has the money uh, gets an order in his favor, or the injunction is not granted, then if you're in the Bombay High Court, you know it's never going to come to trial. You're stuck, and whatever money you can get is great. Whereas if you were in Bangalore, and you were in a city civil court, and you got the matter heard within the first week, rather than in the first three months, you'd get the matter heard within the first week. If it was an injunction, you'd get it done maybe in two days' time. Then you would be in a different position, and you're less likely to negotiate uh, a very poor settlement because you know you have access to justice. So there is a substantive element to this, which is that the Bombay High Court being what it is, not doing trials, forces the defendant to settle for whatever he can get. So Pavita, one way to, you know, sort of think about this, just to pick up from what Murli is saying, we need to see the survey suggests that whatever be the shortcomings of the Bombay High Court, when you compare it to NCLT, DRT, ADR, and Metropolitan Magistrate, people have the best have suggested that they have the they've had the best experience of the Bombay High Court. So either people are satisfied with the system where you know consent terms works is a is an equilibrium that they've settled for because everything else is actually pretty bad, or our survey of course our survey sample is too small, twenty, and the whole idea is to expand it. But also, yes, we should expand it uh, across states and uh, maybe that will explain a lot of what Murli is saying. Uh, 
uh, Murali, uh, just to add to this SEBI sad thing, uh, we didn't do for other cases, but we are doing another project where we looked at Calcutta High Court and we looked at uh, appeals of judgments from tribunals under Calcutta High Court. And the overturn rate was the expected 50% because ideally a court is efficient and the appeals are efficient if 50% of the case judgments are being overturned. That means you've got selected high quality cases for this. In that case where SEBI cases are being overturned at SAT at 70% first appeal shows that SEBI is biased compared to general tribunals in Calcutta, which is a different court, but and tri these tribunals are different rent and a few other tax tribunals. But anything above 50%, according to priest and client, means that the judiciary is biased at the lower level. Uh, I, that would be right if there was certainty in the appeal process. So, uh, again, you're making an assumption that whatever the Calcutta High Court did in 50% of the cases is affirmed by the Supreme Court every time. So, look at it this way. The Calcutta High Court, by your sure. uh, philosophy, sure. got it wrong. The lower court got it wrong 50% of the time. Now, if those cases then went up to the Supreme Court and sure. the Supreme Court overturned 50% of those, hmm. then the lower court is actually right 75% of the time, no? No. So the way it works is the at every appeal rate, the expected, this is a priest and client paper, at every appeal rate, because some people will take their judgment and walk away. At every appeal rate, you should get 50% overturned. Anything deviation from 50% is wrong. So it's a little counterintuitive way of doing the maths. Priest and client have a paper on this, and it's a very seminal paper. Only hard cases should go up in appeal. So some people are taking their judgment, eating it, and walking away. So uh, if you get 50% of the Calcutta High Court judgments overturned at the Supreme Court, then the Calcutta High Court is also doing a good job because hard cases assuming that there's a filtering of cases, some people are dropping out at each level. Uh, so, we, so we can always take the Supreme Court, but the point is at the High Court level. So we can compare SAT with Calcutta High Court. They're at the same level, one appeal. We can always say, okay, whether the Supreme Court was finality, but we are not interested in the matter of the case and the justice. We are looking at accuracy at every level. At any level, if it is more than 70%, you can compare those two and argue that that level is wrong. No, no, but we have... Uh... Uh, appeals being overturned on exceptionally flimsy grounds. So uh, the principle of 50% really strikes me as very odd. Uh, in the UK, for example, uh, we don't have 50% overturns. I mean, single digit overturn. All appeal. appeal or only uh, uh, cases? All, uh, what other cases? In a commercial matter, mm -hmm. to get an appeal overturned from, let's say, the commercial court in the first instance mm. to uh, the court of appeal, mm. the number of cases that go from the commercial court to the court of appeal mm. is a very small percentage. And of that small percentage, there is a very small percentage where the court of appeal overturns it. Yeah, in so, that case, the UK court is inefficient according to free stress life. Which is why I have a big problem with it. I've practiced in three different countries, in the US, in the UK, and in India. and. Uh, therefore, I disagree with the way you're going about the analysis based on this premise that uh, if you turn 50%, I mean, a coin toss is 50%. So, you know, uh, I don't see that as a good basis for uh, judging whether a court is doing its job or not. In fact, we want fewer appeals and we want fewer overturns. And that brings us certainty in the law. Um, what you're saying? No, I was going to. Uh, I was going to say exactly what you are going to say, which is that I mean, I'm assuming you're saying that. Uh, does anybody have any more questions or reports or anything? Uh, we are nearly on time. I think that uh, it will be helpful that you know uh, to schedule follow up calls with uh, people on this call who you think uh, you know can give more inputs. Uh, for instance, Murli has a couple of points, and 
maybe you know you can have a follow up call with him to uh, understand if there's any any way to if there are other ways to improve the work that we are doing how to expand it etc um are there any other last comments no so just okay. the questions that were there and if anybody else has any more input please write to us awesome so uh, thank you so much everyone for joining uh, the third learning circle uh, and in case anyone wants to anchor the next one uh, please let me know uh, and i'll share the recording of this call uh, and further details about the next one soon thank you so much have a good evening okay. thanks everybody thank you